And so this house was covered in vinyl siding. It had poor insulation, poor windows. Um, and it was a conventional lawn, a conventional backyard. And you can actually go onto Google Earth and go to the maps view and watch the progression of our property over the years because Google continued to photograph it. Um, and so when we were looking at this property and, um, and what it could offer us, it was 5,000 square feet or about 5,500 square meters, um, it, really small piece of property. And so we wanted to maximize what we got out of the property. And so permaculture design um, is quite a, a complex subject and it's hard to kind of wrap your head around it. But do you wanna talk a little bit about this illustration? Well, this is another illustration from the book that that turned out incredibly well. We're so excited about it. And we're going to talk more about Jarrett at the end of the day, the illustrator. But I think the pinball machine analogy is a really beautiful way to help explain what permaculture designers try and do. And I think uh, permaculture designers in general love playing this like analogy of the pinball machine. Yeah, and so the goal of the pinball machine is basically that a ball goes into the system, and so we can think of that as phosphorus or nitrogen or water or carbon um, or labor. And our job as designers is to keep those elements in play as long as possible. And every time a ball drops out of the pinball machine, we lose. Um, and Next so that sink, you know, traditional or it's a modern day design, a lot of modern day design, um, those pinballs are just being allowed to enter and go straight to sink. Nobody's hitting the paddles. Nobody's trying to keep any of those things in play, whether it's water that's, you know, uh, you know, clean treated water coming in from the municipal water system, going to your dr drinking water, going to your toilet and one flush, shoom, straight to sink, right? Yep. Or if it's the groceries you're bringing in um, from the grocery store that got them from California, um, you, eat, you eat the inside banana and the peel you put it in the black garbage bag and shoom, straight to sink going yep. out to the municipal landfill. Yep. So we, you know, modern design is this uh, source to sink, source to sink, source to sink on these properties, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so we wanted to take this small piece of property, which is basically just a solar collector. That's all every square meter on earth actually is and optimize every square meter of it that we possibly could in order to keep as many of the energy flows and cycle for as long as possible. And so after, uh, I don't know, 10 years, um, we had completely retrofitted the house and I'll, I'll show you some images of that retrofit. We had uh, increased the R value in the walls by a factor of uh, three or four. Um, we reduced the energy consumption in the house by a factor of 10. We replaced all the windows. Uh, we put in light tubes. We had a solar thermal system on the back. Um, the whole front yard went from being lawn to food forest with a fedge. So all of our, um, all of these little cherry hedges, um, all of these little cherry hedges basically on the front um, were uh, our invitation to the neighborhood to come in and eat some of the abundance coming out of the front yard. Uh, we had birds and bugs showing up on our property that had never been seen in this neighborhood, probably not for a very long time. Um, I had uh, girls uh, and, and school kids, basically, I had one high school girl come by and, and just randomly sit on this front garden box right here and start crying. And I, I happened to be in the front yard and I said, what, what's wrong? And she said, this is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in the neighborhood. And I just can't help but sit down and cry. Um, it was a very, very surreal experience. Um, I used to spy out of this window and watch my neighbors stealing the food out of the front yard. But I wasn't really stealing because we had an open invitation. Of course. There's cherries right there. But they yeah. thought it was stealing. <laughs> um, and so they would like secretly come and, and pick the cherries off of these front bushes. And yeah. it was a, a really lovely uh, to watch the transformation of this front yard. Mm -hmm. And um, and so from an aerial view, um, our front food forest is right here. You can kind of see our solar thermal system and our light tubes, which, which provide light inside of our house. Um, and our backyard garden, a passive solar greenhouse with a rocket mass heater, rainwater harvesting, an outdoor kitchen with cob oven with a cob oven inside of it, um, underground rain storage, um, uh, a, a, an illegal gray water system, which we had to decommission because we got caught by the city. Um, and so lots and lots going on in here. Um, and you well, actually, this is a, a, a video here. So this is going to show you what's going on on our property. Um, and so the point of showing what you can do in such a small space is that you don't need to have a farm in order to 
start meeting your supply chain requirements. You can get an awful lot done in a really small space if you use permaculture design and intentionally stack functions um, onto your property. And so over the years, we had hundreds of people, thousands of people probably come through our property to see what is actually possible. You can kind of see the contrast between you know, this is what a typical property looks like on, on this. Uh, in fact, some of our neighbors even had plastic lawn versus this food forest right here. Okay, and I'm going to have to. So we did everything wrong at, at the beginning. Like we were two engineers from the oil and gas industry. And I remember getting my mother-in-law, convincing her to go and rent a truck with me and bring in, I don't know, what, 15 or 20 yards of horse manure. And I just layered it down like a foot thick. It was just the most ridiculous thing I ever did. Um, <laughs> and I didn't even know very much about water harvesting to begin or with. Or growing. I, I'd never grown a plant when we first got started. And so we covered this this lawn with horse manure and and cardboard and wood chips. We're like, oh yeah, we're, we're doing permaculture now. And the point is, is the plants came through, they, they did what they were supposed to do and biology kind of stepped in and, and replaced anything that we didn't know and because and, the biology knew what to do. Um, and we were just kind of creating conditions for it to thrive and some of some things didn't thrive but but a lot of it did. Um, we sheep mulched the entire backyard. This was a uh, um, Michelle's old trampoline site right here. And it was basically just a gravel pad and we turned it into the most luscious uh, garden as a result of all of the amendments that we put in. Um, we were in the backyard digging swales and I mean we had literally kind of like dinosaur bones coming out of here it was garbage clay mm -hmm. that uh, that grew nothing except for weeds um, and just by getting water access and structures fixed we were able to turn this into an incredibly productive little space mm -hmm. and so this is our first garden right here actually um, we overplanted in kale and chard we have so much food coming out of this garden and it was all the same stuff <laughs> i don't think we ate a fraction of it because I, I don't think we'd ever really eaten kale before this yeah um and potatoes and squash and so luckily our first first garden was really successful because it it really kind of kept us going here's some of the retrofit going on in the house um that uh made the house much more livable uh, in the long run uh, we built a passive solar greenhouse in the backyard. Everybody thinks it's attached to the, to the garage, but it's not. I made tons of mistakes in here. And, and while we're building much bigger greenhouses now, um, a lot of the learnings from these big greenhouses have come from this small, uh, this small greenhouse. And in, in fact, we're going to take this greenhouse off of its foundation. We're going to bring it up to the farm. And I'm going to turn it into a wood kiln because it's perfect for kilning uh, wood. We've got a big forest now and... Um, we're going to be kilning all of our lumber on there. Do you want to say anything about the garden? Um, just bringing it back a little bit to that pinball machine analogy is, you know, before a drop of rain would land on the roof of, of or one of the hard surfaces and basically go almost straight to storm sewer, right? It would, it would travel down the roof, hit the gutter, go down to the, the downpipe and then probably out into the storm sewer. And, um, and, and probably the, the, the water would leave dirtier than when it landed on the roof, right? Because it's picking up stuff from the asphalt roof and what, what have you. But now with all these changes we made and all the paddles we put in, a drop of rain falls on the roof, it hits, uh, the, it hits the downspout, it goes through like a, a leaf diverter, which is a little, a little screen, it goes into a, a large rainwater tank, we have several all over the property. And we hold back a certain volume of rain mm -hmm. so that so that we have storage now now we're creating storages on our property so when we do need the water it's right there but of course on a big rain event it's going to overflow and then that overflow still doesn't go to the storm sewer we redirect that overflow into our garden beds into you know different types of uh, mulched basins and um uh, swales. swales and um, rain gardens basically and then, and then what's really neat about that is now by putting that water into the ground, the biology takes hold of it. Mm -hmm. And um, we're growing plants, we're increasing soil carbon, we're it's like, it's like you're creating this upward spiral. And then finally, when, when, when there's too much water that the rain tank is full and the rain gardens are full, and that water finally spills out into the storm water, storm sewer system, it's cleaner than when it left, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, that's just a tangible example of that, those paddles we have in play. 
And then um, the added bonus of like the, the resources leaving our property are better. And I remember hearing Rosemary talk about that yesterday. And so there's, there's, a, there's a tangible example of how you can do that quite easily in yep. American property. Yeah. yeah, and so food was a yield, rainwater was a yield. Um, two little kids grew up out of this garden mm-hmm. um, and friendships were made. And so Ashley Lubick, um, a good buddy of mine, uh, helped me build my first rocket mass heater in our greenhouse. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, I helped him build a couple of his. Um, and this community of permaculturists started to emerge out of the woodwork as we started to uh, make all the mistakes that we were making on our property. And in fact, one of the things that came out of this as well was the Calgary Permaculture Guild, which Michelle and I both co-founded. And uh, it's still running today. And if you were listening to Jeff Lawton's talk yesterday, um, they're actually starting to take political action now and starting to try and get laws around chickens amended in the city of Calgary so people can start to grow their own chickens and eggs. Um, and so every possible piece of capital that you could um, accumulate um, was being accumulated on this tiny little piece of property in the east side of Calgary. Um, here's uh, our, our first cob oven and we, we uh, ended up putting on a workshop on how to build cob ovens with Ashley as well. Um, turned out into a turtle um, and thousands and thousands of pizzas came out of this oven <laughs> and many relationships. We used to have massive parties in our backyard and people would pick food out of the garden uh, prepare it in our outdoor kitchen, and uh, I would be the the chef, uh, you know, putting the pizzas into the oven and bringing them out. And people were always amazed that we would, were able to to produce pizzas in less than thirty seconds mm-hmm. because our oven got so hot. Um, and so this became a really core part of our property because it was our our community hub. It was where we gathered and shared meals, um, and the abundance coming out of our tiny little garden in our backyard. And Michelle went from being um, a plant killer to the ultimate green thumb, Um, as she is. She's an amazing gardener and all self-taught, all organized. Um, We've got an incredible seedling operation going on right now at our farm. Um, And all all this knowledge came out of uh, small and slow solutions, which is one of Holmgren's principles. Um, You start small and you work up. Yeah. Although the more you know... The more you realize, the more you don't know. <laughs> well, and, and so humility is a big part of all of this stuff and that you, you, you're humbled by uh, every year. And, and when you think about it, uh, the average human life, we don't get that many gardens. Yeah, well, one reason to start if you've never grown a garden is, you know, yeah, okay, I've been gardening for a decade now, but that's still only 10 gardens, right? Like, like, one, you get one, well, especially in Northern, northern climates, so you get one shot every year, right? Mm-hmm. So... Um, one of the one of the best tips I received early on was to take good records, take good notes as you're going through it. Because um, if you if uh, if you want to learn and and be able to incorporate those learnings a full 12 months later, having good notes, at least with my memory, is is really important. And so we had interns come to our property, and so students would come and learn from us uh, and help us with our with our gardens. Um, Here's some of our first interns and they were just such lovely people. They would come rain or shine in our tiny little garden. Oh, there's Jordan and Teresa. Yeah. Look at those people. Tyler. Mm-hmm. And I think Lisa is there too. Oh yeah. Man. We got a, a solar thermal rig from a company called Simple Solar. And I'll talk a little bit about them later. They're one of the sponsors for the event. Um, they make the best solar thermal systems. Most of our hot water, like 80 to 90% of our hot water in our house came from this little simple system. Um, and so we were able to get off of natural gas for, for taking showers. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit more about how their systems work a bit later. And uh, this was one of the most amazing byproducts that came out of this garden with these two little rascals. Garden gnomes. And uh, Rowan on the right um, and Naomi on the left. Um, power to the carrot. <laughs> and, uh, and my goodness, you know, you couldn't have asked for a better... Um, place for them to to get food out of and they used to create little hiding spots and forts inside of the food forest in here and so our Mm -hmm. little tiny forest became one of their favorite places to go out and they would every day they'd go out and they knew all the names of the different plants and the berries and um, it was just such a lovely place and and uh, accoutrement to our our home 
to have these amazing gardens in the front and the backyard. Like biology, the biophilia, basically, right? Yeah. It's another photo of our garden from the backyard. And, you know, when you have such a small space, you've got to go vertical. And so Michelle came up with systems to stack her plants and, uh, and kind of get that vertical edge going. And I mean, everything about our gardens and our food forests were wrong in the sense that, you know, we, we did not have full sun. Um, you know, our, our backyard garden only got six hours and our front yard garden at best got six hours. Um, and so we were always kind of dealing with a sub suboptimal situation, which is what we're so excited about right now with this with more space to play with and actually having a full, a full day of sun in our gardens. Um, but, but those were really important um, constraints to help us learn about um, like learning to grow in, in, in difficult situations makes you a better grower when you get good, good, good uh, conditions. It's easy to get down on yourself with what you don't have. Um, it's, it, it's much more difficult, but much more productive to, to kind of be uh, appreciative for what you do have. And so at the end of our project, before we moved out here, we had a 200 square foot passive solar greenhouse We had an urban clothesline, which in some mm -hmm. parts of the city is illegal. Um, we had a, a shade sale, an outdoor kitchen and cob oven and a little community gathering space here, an underground water storage tank, solar thermal array, uh, super insulated walls, roof and windows, a passively irrigated food forest. So every drop of rainwater got collected either in the garden, a rain tank or the front food forest a fruit hedge. We even convinced our neighbors to let them uh, let us harvest the rainwater off of their roof um, for a case of Budweiser beer. And, uh, and so we were catch, capturing 15,000 liters of water per year in this food forest and 15,000 liters from this food forest. So this roof fed this one and this roof fed this one. Um, and then all the water from the back of our house into these gardens, into the rain tank, all the water off of this outdoor kitchen and all the water off of this garage and um and greenhouse uh, and my gosh like i i can't even imagine how much food we're going to grow this year because we probably got close to an eighth of an acre just in garden now maybe a bit more than that um and through all of it you know our community came forward and this was a sign that we got gifted from one of our students um warren and we put this at the front of our property and and tried to encourage other people to grow and our neighbors did mm -hmm. They started putting in food into their own front yards and so growing food um growing your own food is like printing money 